Hello, hello. It is so wonderful to see all of you here in City Space in, on this soggy night in real life, or IRL, as we now like to say in our Zoom language. Um, welcome to those of you who are here in the room with us. Welcome to those of you who are joining us from the comfort of your own home. We are thrilled that you are here with us for our second ever members only event. It is designed for you, our most devoted listeners. And I am Margaret Lowe. I am WBUR CEO. We had our first event just for members last fall. It was a tribute to Bob Oaks, just as he was passing the morning edition mic to the new host of the show, Rupa Shanoi. Bob hosted the show for 27 years. Uh, what? And what that meant was that for nearly three decades, he got up at oh dark 30 just to help you start your day with everything you needed to know about your city, your country, your world. And we know that people like Bob and like Rupa, who are with us day in and day out, are, they really become like good friends. And we all spend more time with some of our journalists than we actually do with members of our own family. And among the BUR journalists who listeners feel really connected to and who they trust is Meghda Chakrabarty. I don't think I need to tell you that she is the host of On Point, but what you may not know is that we get so much mail about Meghna. <laughs> Letters that begin like this, hello, my radio companion, <laughs> or this, hello, Meghna, I want to give you a compliment. You are the most well-prepared, knowledgeable, up-to-date, and passionate reporter, interviewer, journalist, communicator I have ever heard. Yes. Words like profound, riveting, brave, intelligent, thoughtful, course through this bountiful correspondent. And you know what? Megna is all that. She really, really is. Um, but she would also be the first to tell you that no one is a solo act, and she has a stellar team behind her. On Point is produced right here at WBUR, two floors up. I said one floor up somehow. I forgot, but it's two floors up. It airs nationally on hundreds of public radio stations across the country. Millions, millions of people listen to the show every week on their member station or on the daily pop podcast. I suspect many of you are longtime listeners, and you may know that in the fall of 2020, we totally reinvented On Point. We began harnessing all our resources into one powerful hour every day, investing more time, more care, more reporting, more craft into each minute of the show with compelling narrative, sound rich elements that match really deeper, heavily researched conversations. So we like to think of the show as explanatory journalism. And at the same time, it's really, it's every day, it's like an exploration and it's intimate. Its purpose, we like to say, is let's make sense of this world together. So since the show was reinvented, it's added stations, it's grown its audience, it's won a bucket load of impressive awards. And thanks to the smarts, creativity, and relentless hard work of the aforementioned team and people like On Point Senior Editor Dory Scheimer, a force multiplier. Uh, Dory, Megna, and the team set an incredibly high bar for themselves and the show. And tonight, we're going to have the pleasure of letting them peel back the curtain to give you a window into what it takes to get on point on the air every single day. With that, please join me in welcoming Megna Charcobardi and her senior editor, Dory Scheimer. Dory's uh, so they can give us direction. She's the she's the um, she's the two brains behind uh, behind the scenes. So I'm gonna leave myself in her capable hands. Well, this is very fun to turn the tables on Magna tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one with someone in my ear, and I get to ask <laughs> you questions. Thank you, Margaret, so much for that nice introduction. And I want to start by saying that. Megna is all of those things that Margaret just described, and she's really fun to work with. Um, she makes producing On Point, which is 
kind of a bear to do every day. She makes it really fun. So I hope that you feel that from us tonight that you are, you are the smartest person I've ever worked with and you really make it a good time to do it too. So do you, Sorry. <laughs> there's no doubt. So a lot of people are familiar here with your work on On Point Every Day, but we're going to start with how this Magna Chakrabarty <laughs> became this Magna Chakrabarty, starting with what it was like for you growing up in Oregon, what kind of childhood you had out in the Pacific Northwest. So, um, so thank you for that. I actually really love to talk about my childhood, and, and regular listeners might know that ever, actually ever since I started hosting On Point with much regularity, I actually say, oh yeah, I grew up in Oregon, or Pacific Northwest, or whatever. Um, although I've been living half, half my life here, um, since I moved here for grad school, so I'm sort of like a New England Northwesterner now. Um, but I had a great childhood. I, I mean, I was the, the child of two immigrants from India, and growing up in the 80s, I had a free-ranging childhood. <laughs> you know, stranger things, but without the aliens. Um, <laughs> and I grew up in sort of a medium-sized town full of wonderful people, a great school district, and um, I mean, it was ideal in that 80s kind of way. And it, it was interesting because I grew up in Corvallis, Oregon, that had, uh, you know, the home of Oregon State University. And at that time, it had a really huge tech presence with Hewlett Packard. And so it was, um, at, it was simultaneously quite diverse and also pretty white. So, um, but it was uh, the kind of place <coughs> where you could, you, sorry, where you could be free to explore and it was easy to run into a lot of very fascinating people which I did frequently while riding my bike around town <laughs> and out into the country for hours on end a little different than riding a bike down Beacon Street a yeah, little a little safer possibly we talk a lot about our upbringing and our parents and so tell us first of all we have to see this photo of your family <laughs> so tell the audience a little okay. bit about this. I love, this picture is in my bedroom right now. And it is the most Daisy picture I could possibly, <laughs> like the most South Asian immigrant picture ever because, because my mom made this. She like got the, the frame probably at like Home Goods or TJ Maxx or something. And, and what I love is at the bottom, it's like the family that plays together stays together while earning their degrees together. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is more fun than academic achievement. But this is absolutely a picture of, my, of, of, like, of how the Chakrabartis identify them, themselves. Um, but yeah, there's me at the bottom getting my undergraduate degree. That's my brother. Uh, he lives in California. That's my dad getting his third or fourth I can't even remember now. Um, and that's my mom. Um, and I should tell you that the reason why this photograph actually is quite important to me is because my parents grew up in uh, pretty severe poverty in India. My dad uh, grew up in, it was just he was born just before partition, so it was greater India. And then his village ended up in, West, uh, in East Pakistan, and so they had to move over. But his uh, village, he went to school in a barn <laughs> that was used for housing the buffalo at night uh, and educating skinny, dysentery-afflicted children during the day. Um, and my mother grew up very impoverished in Mumbai and had a strong affinity for science and math, but her parents couldn't afford to send her to the girls' school that was the better science and math school. So she taught herself, uh, earned the money, and put herself through um, secondary school and college and a master's degree, and that's her holding her master's degree in chemistry. So um, that's, yeah, yeah. So the, the notion of what my family came from and what they've been able to do here in the United States is a very significant um, factor in who I am and how I see the world. And of course, you know, fully developed now. But there was a year in school that you say that you really felt proud to be an American, and it was kind of a turning point. Yeah, fifth talk to grade. me about that year. Fifth grade. Do we have a, the fifth grade? Yeah. Picture? Can we bring up a? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so y y the reason why we're doing this is because I can actually see every day in my work now how these early experiences are channeling through what I try to do at On Point. 
Um, this is a picture of my fifth grade class in um, on our big annual five day field trip in Astoria, Oregon. I'm the one like with my hand kind of like that with the crazy dark hair and the puppy <laughs> jacket. Um, and uh, my teacher that when I was in fifth grade, I'm actually still in touch with him. Uh, his name was is Mr. Hart, and he was a genius. Um, that's Mr. him. <laughs> oh my God! And yes, that is me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he was an absolute genius and made me a reader that year. Like this man had a box of books, literally this big, and, and, and any, any purpose, any holiday, anyone's birthday, someone's aunt's birthday, whatever, he'd pull out the box and he'd be like, here, have a book, happy aunt's birthday. <laughs> um, and, and he was very passionate about US history. And, in, and it made, that was the year where you know, I learned about, and this was in the late 80s, no, mid 80s. And, and even at that time, he was telling, he taught us about like the, the greatness of documents like the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and their imperfections at the same time. You know, and, and I remember he gave us assignments like, like pick a founding father, Go research that founding father, and you have to write an essay about a three-page essay about a certain topic in the voice of that founding father. Now, I remember who I did. I don't remember how I did it. I chose James <laughs> Madison. Don't ask me why. The other day when we mentioned the yeah. Federalist Papers. <laughs> I, would so, love, I would love an on yeah. presentation of that. But this, this, this man, he was this charismatic, passionate lover of education, lover of American history in both its greatness and imperfections, as I said, um, really dedicated to um, raising us as citizens. So incorporating what we were learning in the classroom right back into the community was a big value of his. And I learned more in his class uh, about civics and government and history than I can say I have learned, in, than I learned in any other class in high school or college thereafter. So, and I'm telling you, there are days on the show now where um, I'll remember, you know, we'll be, we'll be preparing for an hour and there's some aspect of governance and I'll remember something that he said and I won't directly use that, but that'll trigger like a series of questions in my mind that we do the extra research on, et cetera. So that was 30 years ago and it's still, <laughs> like he's, he was a life changer. Yeah, how, do, how important do you think that kind of civics education is? Profoundly, profoundly important. Um, and like I said, that was the year that I felt like I became an American. Even though, I mean, I was born in the United States, so like obviously by, by birth I was American, but this sense of what does it mean? What can it mean? What does it not yet mean? Um, and so, you know, it's funny because in this day and age, it may not be so popular to say, but I'm a very proud American. Um, and I am, I'm a very proud American. And you know, like sometimes we proud Americans must be loyal critics as well. Um, and yeah. so, you know, those two, those two things are not mutually exclusive, but that was the year where, um, where I first felt the full flush of that. Yeah. And I think listeners hear that through the show all the time. I mean, we've dedicated countless hours to what is happening in our democracy, how to preserve this democracy that you're proud of, that yeah. we all want to be proud of. Yeah. Um, so I think listeners can hear that shining, shining through. Um, I do want to just make a note real quick. If you all have questions for Megna, you can submit them to us on Slido, um, sli.do, and enter Megna, and we'll ask some of your questions too. So just so everybody knows. Go easy. <laughs> okay, this is a surprising thing that I actually just shared with a guest today, um, but that most people don't know about you. So did you go to school, to college for journalism? No. <laughs> what did you go to college for? Civil and environmental engineering. And how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, it happened because in part, um, as the child of two very scientifically minded <laughs> South Asian immigrants, it was kind of baked in the cake. Um, but also, I, I mean, I, I have a, had and have a great passion for, for science um, in particular. And so that's what I kind of started thinking I was gonna be a physicist. And then I was like, no, I'll do mechanical engineering. Then I hit like 
electromagnetics in physics, and I was like, I can't handle this. Um, and so eventually ended up in civil and environmental engineering, and it was fantastic. Um, I loved learning it, actually. And it turns out it's a fantastic education for becoming a journalist. Why? Well, because I, th I know this is going to sound a little crazy, but there are, there are sort of intellectual commonalities between being uh, a great scientist and a great journalist, because they are both seeking endeavors. And fundamentally, a great scientist asks questions about the world and then seeks through experimentations to find the answers to those questions and has to be open to the fact that their original hypothesis may often and most often will be wrong. Uh, and so that, that same thrust of wanting to know about the world, wanting to understand better something about the world that doesn't make sense or that you don't have the answers to, and trying over and over and over again to find the right questions to produce an answer. And then even if the answer doesn't comport to what you thought before, still trying to understand how that answer fits into the broader scheme of things, you can see how, at least in my mind, they're, they're similar sets of skills. Um, and so, and just the, un, just the unwillingness to, to accept anything as a final endpoint as well, right? Because like any scientist or engineer will tell you that first design, <laughs> it's only the first design um, or the first ex experiment. So, you know, same thing. Like we've done lots of shows on seemingly the same subject, but we come back in a different way to try and understand it from a different angle to give us a fuller picture. And I mean, even in our production process, we're constantly testing the hypothesis. Yeah. I mean, what you or what I or what someone else on our team pitches in a meeting after research and testing of that and talking to experts, we come back and say, well, actually, that wasn't quite right. Let's retest something a little different. Yeah. And, and I mean, we even did that today, like on the air. Like sometimes I'll be like, OK, so now given what we know so far, what we heard, like this is the question we're asking in, in the hour. Is it still the right question? Um, sometimes we get lucky and it is still the right <laughs> question. Other times it's not. But then when it's not, it's like, okay, well, so then let's go in this direction and see if we can um, unearth something else. But I'll just be brief yeah. here. Um, you know, the other thing is there's lots of different kinds of journalism, right? There is pure investigatory journalism, which is an art form in and of itself. There's narrative, like storytelling journalism. I mean, I think what what we're trying to do like, falls in the, in the middle of that because I don't want us, we never do this, we never go into an hour th presuming that we know what the end of the story is. So it's never like purely a narrative arc that we've already set out. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, there's, some art, there's some aspects to telling a good story so that it's useful and engaging to people listening in which we try to then get that sort of, uh, interrogative <laughs> part of looking at the world, like weave that in. Yeah, we heard that from a listener today, that today's show connected all the scattered thoughts that they had been having. And I think yeah. that is kind of what we're trying to do, is draw those connections exactly. in what's happening around the world. We need to bring up this college photo, because it's not to be missed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, oh my god. Ni 1996. Engineer. I ended up being in the class of 90. Eight, but that's a different story. Um, yeah, so this is the first class of civil and environmental engineers from Oregon State University, and that is indeed me in the top <laughs> left-hand corner sporting my Pacific Northwest plaid. Yes. I mean, yeah, this was the era of Nirvana, et cetera. So. Geographically and yeah. age appropriate. It was great. I mean, I, I started my undergraduate career at Stanford, went there for a couple of years, and it wasn't working out for me, and so took a break. Um, and went back and finished my time at Oregon State, and it was phenomenal. Like, for example, that woman at the bottom, uh, Linda Peterson, the thing that I really valued of many things from my OSU education was there was age diversity in the students going there and lots of socioeconomic diversity. Uh, and I feel like I actually learned quite a bit more from my fellow peers there than I did from my peers at Stanford. Uh, but Linda, for example, was a partner in many projects that we did. I lost, I've lost track of her, unfortunately. But you can see she was a mom of two girls at the time who were in late elementary and middle school. And she was a mom, a single mom, and working, 
and going to school to become an engineer. And she was a phenomenal person whom I learned a great deal from. And that's not a really an experience you generally get to have uh, at, at the elite private institutions. We talk about this a lot as fellow state school yeah. grads in a sea of not state school grads. Uh, we're going to do a lightning round here of some questions collected by some, the On Point team. Oh my god, OK. All right, really fast. Favorite singer? <laughs> my daughter? Can I say that? I mean, you can, but you also have like a real affinity for Beyonce. Beyonce? Oh, and also Rihanna and Giddens? Yeah. Oh. OK, OK, finally. <laughs> oh my god. I, I'm gonna, every time I like don't come up with a quick answer, I'm going to blame it on COVID brain, OK? OK, this one I know you'll have an answer to. Um, wine or a cocktail? Cocktail. Ocean or mountains? <gasps> That's not fair. How about <laughs> mountains that are by the ocean? Fine. Best trip you've ever taken? Oh. I'm really lucky. There have been so many. OK. I, the, one of the best trips I ever took was on a boat around um, South America. Amazing. Through Cape Horn. It was astonishing. Who were you with? My parents. Oh, They're like awesome. inveterate globetrotters, and they dragged me and my brother around the world with them everywhere, and it was phenomenal. I love that. OK, we are going to now move into your career here at WBUR, which has spanned 20-some years. Can I just take one second to tell you why that trip was so amazing? Yes. It started in Buenos Aires, went down the coast of Argentina, around Cape Horn, and up to Santiago, Chile. And it was on a cruise ship. But, um, but the, this cruise ship was 90,000 tons. Okay, And when we went around Cape Horn, uh, they had to pick up a special pilot just to get the boat around Cape Horn because the ocean, the southern ocean is so rough. So he gets on, and there was like this six hour period where this 90,000 ton ship with 7,000 people on board was literally being tossed around like, like by the ocean. Like it was, I felt like a ball of string of yarn that a cat was playing with. And then we like get just around Cape Horn, and all of a sudden, it's like literally blue sky and flat ocean. And I was thinking to myself, that was harrowing. Um, <laughs> like Magellan did it in a boat rel like the size of a matchbox. And so it just it got me thinking about how um, insanely brave and insane, um, insane people were in the 15th century. When was that trip? Oh, a long time ago. It was 2005. Time for another one. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not getting on a cruise ship for a long time. No, we did a show early in the <laughs> pandemic that pretty much solidified me never getting on yeah. a cruise ship ever, <laughs> ever again. Um, so tell us how this civil engineering major ended up from Pacific Northwest, from Oregon, ended up at WBUR in Boston. Well, long story short, I went to grad school here, got my um, master's of science at the Harvard School of Public Health. I was supposed to get a PhD. That was the goal. Um, <laughs> my dad says, got to get a PhD, not an MD. MDs are just glorified vocational degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, any MDs out there. Sorry. My dad's like a very theoretical science person. So, so, oh my God, I hope, I, like, please don't get mad. Um, <laughs> if you want to, okay, if you want to write a, an angry email, you can send it to me and I'll forward it to my parents. <laughs> but anyway, so, because like, you have to, you have to, you have to um, contribute original knowledge through your dissertation to the body of science. Okay. But anyway, I didn't do that. Um, and uh, as I was finishing up the first couple of years, I kind of figured out that I just didn't have the, um, the passion to commit to the work and effort it would take to, to do a PhD, right? And those are pretty coveted spots. So like, I wasn't going to take it for someone else. Um, and so I kind of had like a couple months out in the metaphorical wilderness. And I had always been a BUR listener. <laughs> Always. It was like on in my apartment 24-7. And so just one day out of the blue, I, um, I had heard a documentary that the then documentary team did. And it was that team was run by um, a genius of a woman named Anna Benstead. And I just like wrote her a, a, a letter. I typed it out and printed it out in like a dot matrix printer or something. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, stuck it in the mail. And you know, you think you're never going to hear from anybody. Uh, and lo and behold, she sent me an email. She said, I got your letter. Let's meet. 
And so I had a cup of coffee with her, and um, I interned, essentially, while finishing up my master's degree. And I, was, and I did research for her. That's all, that's all I did. But I was in the building, and I was hooked. What hooked. about it hooked you? Well, it was the thrill of, of like exploration. Uh, and you get to be a student every day. So uh, you know, it, was, it was like you get to ask whatever question you want <laughs> and try to find the answer to it. And also, it's quite a thrill to, be, to call up anybody <laughs> and be like, I'm calling from WBUR. Will you talk to me? And they're like, yeah. Like, wait, you just won the Nobel Prize and you will talk to me? It's, it's like, it's crazy. Yeah, so like, you get addicted to that. Um, and so this was, ooh, when was this? This was 2000, 2001, so a long time ago. And then I, and I finished my internship with her, uh, finished my Harvard degree, and then 9-11 happened. And so BUR, very quickly put together a team to do evening live coverage, because at that time, um, I mean, NPR was a different organization than it is now, and, and they wanted to have continuous coverage throughout the day and the, and the night, and BUR offered to help provide that in the evening, and they needed people to help. And so um, Anna said, come in <laughs> and, and do whatever um, they tell you to do. And, and that's how I came in as a, as a freelance producer, and I've been here ever since. At On Point. Well, at, at On Point, I came, it was then called Special Coverage, soon became On Point. I was there for five years as a producer and director, and then I uh, reported for BUR on transportation and environment, uh, and then was very privileged and lucky to be able to host Radio Boston for eight years, and now back to On Point. So that takes us to a great audience question, which is, do you remember what and who was your first interview at Radio Boston, and what do you remember about it? OK, I don't remember my first, first Radio Boston interview, but I remember one of my first, and it was with Governor Patrick. <laughs> and he's a wonderful man who also can get mad. <laughs> because I had done some reporting about um, a he was trying to fuse what was then the Mass Pike Authority with the other transportation authority. Now it's the Department of Transportation in Massachusetts. Trying to fuse them together. It was a really, really big political, economic thing. And I had talked to the then transportation secretary named Jeff Mullen. And he told me that the money, he told me on the record that the money, saving, money savings that the Patrick administration said would come by virtue of this fusion of, and creation of the DOT wasn't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> unless uh, something very key happened in court. So I asked the governor about this, and he got very mad. <laughs> he was like, who told you that? Well, I was like, your own transportation <laughs> secretary, governor. And then I, and I actually learned a lot of lessons from that interview, because I went at him quite hard. Um, and he was not appreciative of that. Even though I had the facts on my side, my approach was not the most productive. Um, so. It, it was fine towards the end, but that is an interview I would do all over again if I could. Still presenting him with the same facts to try to get um, you know his his and his administration's point of view, but perhaps in a different way so that we could get past his um, ruffled feathers. What, we're going to get to some of your memorable reporting mm -hmm. work before Radio Boston, but what do you think the difference is? The fundamental difference between hosting a show and hosting interviews like that and the reporting work that you did before? Well, I mean, in terms of the shows that I've been fortunate enough to host on, the, what, the biggest difference is that they're live. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, everyone's going to hear what's going to happen, the good and the bad. Um, and then the, the, the second difference is, is that uh, when you're a reporter, you can ask and you should ask the same question about 65 different times. Um, and you can spend more time and you can go you know, this way and that way, et cetera, because hopefully the person that you have, you're having a conversation with, you have more time and you're search, searching for specific things that they can add to help tell the overall story. Because you're going to weave together a lot of sources as a reporter. As a host in an interview, it's you and one other person. And you have to make that time count because it's a set amount of time. There needs to be a sense of a beginning, middle, and end, something that listeners can walk away with that deepens their understanding. 
and you're doing it live. So I think those are some of the, the, the bigger differences. I, I, I do find it thrilling, though. I prefer to do live programs. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is a thrill every, every day. We don't exactly know where it's going to go. Um, but I want to go back to your Radio Boston reporting, because yep. you did some incredible reporting work that we at On Point and producers still I mean, reference and listen to the work that you did to inform our own work now. And I want to talk about a particular story about evictions. Can you tell us a little bit about that reporting that you did? So we did a, a series called Evictions in East Boston that ended up being um, a story that we followed for three years. Uh, particularly me, Jamie Bologna, who's now working at WGBH, and uh, Alison Bruzek, who's a big person at the New York Times Audio now. Um, and it, this emerged from like a one line in an article in the Globe. The Globe was talking about how prices, uh, rental prices were going up dramatically in East Boston um, and that long established families were being pushed out there. And in this story, there was one line that said, and activists, housing activists are trying to get rental laws changed. And that wasn't the focus of the Globe story, so then they moved on. And I was like, what? <laughs> Because you know, rental laws in the state of Massachusetts, and particularly in Boston, are impossible, next to impossible to get changed. So we called around and found out that there was definitely something there, this big push to get a just cause eviction statute passed. Three years later, it did not get passed. But um, that's what started this series on ev high eviction rates in a historic part of Boston. Let's take a listen to one piece of that. live in East Boston in 30 years. Olga Pasco had been living in the same East Boston apartment for the past 25 of those 30 years. But this past August, she was forced to move. This is my side, and this side is Anna and Candy's and the kids. And this is the space I share with my daughter when she comes. She sleeps here. So up here is where the women sleep, and downstairs is for the men. Uh -huh. sí. Olga Pasco's bed is neatly made. It's two cots pushed together and covered with blankets and a printed bed sheet. The other bed, where her friends sleep, look as if the children have just finished taking a nap. A white plastic baby gate blocks the stairs, and there's some privacy, but only the little afforded by a folding temporary screen near the beds. I mean, that's, it's nice, but it's not home. No, no es un hogar. No. That's because Olga Pasco is living in a church, our Savior's Lutheran in East Boston. Her bed is upstairs in the nave, wedged behind the pews, about a dozen rows back from an altar dominated by a life-size painting of Jesus. Yeah, aquí vivimos. Yes, this is where we live, thanks to Pastor Don. He opened the doors for us to live here, because the landlords, who have all the money in the world, they threw us out on the streets without compassion. They knew we were human beings, but nothing mattered to them. What about that piece still resonates for you, or what do you still hear in that? Uh, it was something to see a woman and her family being forced to live in a church because they had literally just been thrown out. Uh, I shouldn't say thrown out. They were, well, they were evicted because they couldn't make the rent. Their rent had been raised by 30%. Um, and then to know that that was happening all over East Boston. Um, and not just East Boston, obviously, in places all over town. But, um, and so we, it was our way in on something that was affecting a lot of people, but not, um, at that time, not getting a lot of attention. So, and then, and then it's like, you know, once you see something, you can't unsee it. So we kept going out to, to East Boston, which of course is like, it's a very important historic neighborhood in this town, like waves of new Bostonians first came there. Um, and you just start seeing it everywhere. You start seeing the, the building conversions and the families who have moved out. But, but there's, there's different sides to this story, right? Like there's also the fact that, well, there's a lot of wealth in Boston and the wealth wants to go somewhere. And some, in some cases, the neighborhoods were being improved. They were physically being improved. That was happening too. So um, I think I just, I remember everything about it. And like I said, we followed it for three years. And it was a story about 
advocacy that sometimes fails also. I think that maybe people outside of public radio or outside of journalism don't understand how unique it is to be able to follow a story for three yep. years. Um, how do you think about that? I mean, the ability at WBUR through your career to be able to, I mean, we do some 17 minute pieces. <laughs> like we, we do yeah. break the convention sometimes. And I mean, some of the old stuff of yours I've li listened to breaks the conventions of what is usually accepted in the public radio format. Yeah, and I'd say that it's more accepted now because we were talking about this the other day yep. because podcasts have really um, proven that you all <laughs> have a very deep desire for rich and lengthy storytelling, and I completely agree with you <laughs> on that. But like, there was a time in the past where like I would do a 17-minute story about a factory that no longer exists in Pittsfield, and I'd sometimes be like, I can't believe they're letting me do this. <laughs> um, but we did it. Uh, and it's, it's an it's a absolute privilege. It's very, I mean, now in audio more than before because of podcasts. But outside of, outside of audio, it's very, very, very hard. Very hard to find a, a journalism organization that's willing to like, let people invest that much time and energy. Uh, in telling sometimes obscure but always important stories that take a long time. Yeah. Um, and so I, it's it, an absolute, just I, I thank my lucky stars every day that I work here. Same. I mean, my past job, our max time limit was 90 seconds. Yeah. So. And she'd have to like re <laughs> report on like a bill that was a thousand pages long. Yeah. And she got and a I'm minute sure and that half. really informed a lot of people about what was in it. Yeah. Um, Another great story of yours. Can you talk about Luis Ramirez? Because I was fascinated by this story. OK, I could talk all night about this. I'm, I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm going to keep my eye on the clock. <laughs> so, so this was actually an interesting story that was mostly reported um, digitally and um, in print, but we did radio stories that go along with it. In 2017, the T hired a new general manager. His name was Luis Ramirez. And there was a big fanfare around it because he was uh, formerly in the private sector. And he came out, and on the, on, I didn't get to actually go to the press conference that day when he was revealed, um, but I watched it. And he, he comes up to the podium, he's like, I'm a turnaround guy. I am the turnaround guy. And the tea needs turning around. I was like, oh, this is very interesting. <laughs> um, and I think I tweeted out, so many questions. Like, <laughs> I put out a tweet saying, I have so many questions. Um, so I just started looking into the, or he had worked at GE and at a company down in Texas. And I started looking into, um, the company We're in Texas. Start rolling some oh of yeah, tweets. so many questions. That was the one on the day that he was hired. So many questions. So then I like looked into this particular company. He was a CEO of called Global Power. I'm, I'm going to hurry now through a lot of reporting. It turns out that while he was there, while he was CEO, you know, with Sarbanes Oxley, you have to like, you have to sign financials, and for three straight years, he signed um, 10Ks. That as soon as he left the company the company had to refile the 10Ks because there were accounting errors in all of them. And one of the major, biggest accounting errors was in one year that he was CEO, they went from uh, an in net income that year of what was claimed to be something like $17 million to minus 43 million <laughs> when they refiled, okay? So long story short, the, as soon as he left, even though he claims it was not because of this, they refiled. They got delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. The, the shareholders lost 75% of the value of their company. Um, they had to fire a lot of people. They, fired a whole, they closed a whole factory in Tennessee. They told those workers in Tennessee it's because of changes in the gas and oil market. Uh, but they told their shareholders it was because they had to refile and lost their revolving line of credit, blah, 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 blah. There was a shareholder lawsuit against him filed by a, uh, a, uh, an attorney here in Boston. The SEC was investigating. Cool, right? This guy's going to run the T. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I'm like, woo! I love the SEC's database, because uh, it was all public information. I want to emphasize this was all public information that I found within a, like, a day of searching through Edgar, which is the SEC's database. OK, I'm going over my two minutes. Long story short, big kerfuffle. The governor stood behind him um, and said a couple weeks later that, you know, he said, he said, Luis Ramirez is the man that the MBTA needs right now. And I'm sure that 
a year from now when we have this conversation, everyone will agree with me. 15 months later, Ramirez resigned. <laughs> so the governor was right, technically, that 12 months later, no one said anything. But, but three months after that, Ramirez resigned. And someone from the T, the finance board, told me on background, <laughs> he was like, yeah, that guy was a real BS artist. Uh, and I was like, dude, we tried to tell you. And uh, pretty much everything you need to know about working with Meghna is a 37-part Twitter thread <laughs> on an SEC filing that she just digs into from one question at a press conference. I mean, that really is what, ha what happens a lot. Totally. Yeah, it's, it's always, I, we call them the keyhole questions. Like when someone says, oh, I'm a turnaround guy. Well, what'd you turn around? Let's <laughs> take a look. How'd that turnaround go? Yeah. Yeah. Not so well for. I mean, they're, they're not rocket science questions, right? So. so we have some great audience questions about how you prepare for interviews, how those interviews go. We've got to listen to some kind of contentious moments from some interviews <laughs> that you've done over how do interviews the go? years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Fauci, I have one more quick question here. Sure. But I hear you very strenuously trying to not answer a question here. I am answering your question. We don't know what that number is. And that's why I say, and you think I'm being evasive, I'm not. <laughs> Let's all get vaccinated and you'll know it when you see it. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. You're wearing me down, though, Megan. <laughs> I, I, Mr. George, I understand you're saying you're saying a lot of things, and I, if if I can just jump in here, I I've heard a couple of thoughts here. I've heard a couple of thoughts, and I just want to ask you. I just want to ask you about. I don't necessarily want to want to want to talk over each other. So so forgive me for doing this, but you you're, you interrupt me all the time. Well, you you've said a couple of very interesting things. And I just want to explore them a little bit further here. You're you're missing the point. So I just want to get a couple of things clear. Are you equating the United States court of law as being equivalent or worse than a Soviet court? I'm just saying that's the way the Soviet system worked. But we're, we're talking about a, a state in the, in the United States of I know, America. And you really haven't seen, uh, don't know much about Oregon, do you? I actually uh, uh, grew up in Oregon. I lived there from really? the time I was Where? two to the time I was 23. Uh, in Corvallis, from? Oregon, in fact. And I know you Corvallis, spend a lot of time yeah. in Eugene, Oregon, so I know Multnomah County I, very, I, you very know, well. I, I would have pegged you as a Eugenie in a, in a heartbeat. Actually, I said, Cor I said Corvallis, sir. I said yeah, Corvallis. I know, but they border, and it's, the, it's really the same ultra-leftist crowd. That's actually Antifa. Oh, let's be, let, let's Congressman, be just a moment. We just raised, just a, we Congressman, just raised transportation we are the moderators here. We I will we give you a chance to respond. We just raised transportation in Chelsea. I will we give need you a to chance. recognize we will. that five years ago there was no silver line in Chelsea. I'm not talking about The silver line now goes to Chelsea to serve Ladies and gentlemen, both of you, please, we will give you chances to respond. We, we have will. To give us a chance to respond on time. The rules are a minute each plus moderator well, discretion. That's not what you've done thus far. We have, we have agreed to the rules in advance. I, that is not I, what you have done We thus will far. give you a chance to respond because part of our job is to press you when we hear answers that don't fully answer the question. So, Councillor Presley, I would... So, just a quick thing there. Senator Warren has said she voted for that act because she didn't want state-level Monsanto regulations. She wanted well, national-level regulations. I mean, there's context well, there. Well, you know but what? I do, she, I do, this, I do, this is, this is I, a flim flam. Well, let me finish. This actually, is the kind of way actually, politicians are. Actually, let me are. finish, if you could. Yeah. Well, was to, well you shouldn't it, be defending her, though. You're defending her. I am not defending you her. You are. She voted for the Monsanto context. Protection Act. Let's look I, at it. She voted yay. I am offering context for that Well, why? Why not look at the because that's context. my job. And yes, they were all men. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, gents. It's true. Uh, it's true. I was like racking my brain for a time where um, uh, a female guest did that. They get mad for sure, but the interactions are different. Definitely different. Um, and I think that those clips just answered this question. But how much of the interview goes as planned on On Point? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you deal with, you know, when the interview is going in a different direction than what we've planned? So actually, I mean, those are some highlights. <laughs> Selectively curated. Um, when we say go as, as planned, I would say that in terms of like, our goal for what we want to explore in the hour usually goes as planned. But what people say, well, their answers to the questions are not always expected. And so frequently, we're still in the same realm of exploration, but we might end up in a different place. Um, 
And so in that sense, they both almost always go as planned and almost never go exactly uh, as planned. Yeah, this is a follow-up question from the audience. To what extent would you push someone on their views, such as, quote, Trump was sent by God? Where do, where do you draw the line when things are, you know, factually wrong? Well, so, so, it, or so, untrue. It's, so it's interesting because, first of all, if a elected official said that, then I would push hard because that person has a has a duty to represent everyone in their district or their state or their city or their nation. Um, but if it's someone, you know, we try to talk to, to people living their lives. And we have had uh, many people who, who voted for, for Donald Trump. I don't think anyone actually went so far as to say he was sent by God. but. But f I'm thinking of our Trump round of our round, round tables, tables with yeah. the woman who had COVID. Yeah, and she was like, "Well, if I was meant to die, I was meant to die. That's yeah. God's will." And but so in those cases, the, the the only really important question is why, or what do you mean, or why is that important to you, and how, how does that how does that matter to you when you vote, or what is it that he's done that makes you think that? Because the point there is not to browbeat someone about what they believe in. It's to understand why they believe in it and how it impacts how they choose to live as an American. So in, in that case, we're not, I'm not, I, I, would, I wouldn't use the word pushing, mm -hmm. but more sort of like trying to create a welcome space where we can get to know them better. I think actually the Trump roundtables are a great example because listeners were very frustrated with us. Very mad. They were really unhappy about those roundtables. What would you say the goal of those conversations were. So for those of you who didn't hear them, we had a series of round tables with all sorts of different Trump voters uh, leading up to the, and all sorts of different voters, Biden voters as well, but people were really frustrated by the Trump Yeah, we got a lot of social media pushback from people who said, do not give Trump voters a platform. How dare public radio give these people a platform? I disagree. Um, these people are our are, are fellow Americans. And if we cannot have a single space in which there's mutual respect, profound disagreement, but mutual respect to hear each other out, what does that say about this country? Like, I, 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 I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna tell someone what they should believe, but I really wanna know why they believe it. And, 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 and I think it's, it's emotional. And so a lot of you know, those responses that we got on social media were during the hour, and people were like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And I was like, well, because you're responding the way you are, that's why we're doing this. Okay, but this, because we're not talking to Tucker Carlson, right? <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't, you know, someone from Fox spouting out their authentically hateful disinformation and bile. This is someone who's absorbing that, and we want to know the impact of that. Come on. And also, they live in your neighborhood. <laughs> Please, like it, so I mean, again, this is like, I'm a proud American and a loyal critic. And because I'm those two things at the same time, we have to make space to listen to each other. Have to, have to, have to. And if we, and if we can't even have little pockets like on point where that happens, then we truly are doomed. Um, so, so that's what I have to say. <laughs> that's the hill I will die on. Um, <laughs> But again, again, these were voter roundtables. The, the situation is quite different when we have people Elected in power. Right. People with power. Yeah, and uh, voters have power too, uh, you know, but, but it's a different scale of power. Okay, but also you've had a lot of fun, including yeah. on On Point. Let's listen to a really fun one. No, no, oh. I'm, I, I tell you, I'm not, I'm not a person who's prone to fangirling ever. Yeah. Just, this is not who I am, but you're the exception. You're one of the exceptions, so, oh. so I'm going to put my professional hat on here and, 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 and hopefully do this right, okay? So, uh, oh, you're, you're per, you are perfection. You stop. Are, you are a work of <laughs> stop. art. You, you, were, this, you were born to do this. So stop, 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 you were, stop. Yes, it's all good. <laughs> I'm a f***ing radio genius. You know I, I know how to do this sh Yes, you do. <laughs> God, that's my favorite interview of all time. <laughs> that was before we even got started because I could hardly speak. I, 
I've, I've never heard you like that. I heard that clip and I was like, who is this? I have never seen this. I was in Mama Roo's space and I was happy. Which is an amazing transition to, you had been a reporter for WVUR, you hosted Radio Boston for eight years. Amazingly, yes. wonderfully. Um, what made you take the job at On Point? <laughs> um, so, someone I really love and respect told me I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> He's back there. <laughs> um, and in addition, so I loved hosting Radio Boston. I loved it. Um, and, and at the same time, I, I have to say, I was actually kind of like scared about the, I, even the idea of like being one of the fill-in hosts for On Point, just to test it out, because it's like so big. Um, but I think, I can't remember who said this one, so I'm paraphrasing someone I don't even recall. So whoever you are, forgive me. But um, there's a phrase that someone said once that said, if you're scared, you probably should do it, right? Professionally, right? If it's, if it's making you nervous and you think you can't, you probably should try. So I, I tried and um, felt pretty good. And, you know, I just crossed my fingers and hope I would do a decent job. Is there, this is a great question from the audience. Was there anything that came up for you in that transition from hosting a local show at Radio Boston to On Point that surprised you or that you didn't expect? Um, didn't expect, let me think. I have to say not really because the first five years of my journalism career were at On Point. So um, as a producer and a director, so what the show was trying to accomplish was not unfamiliar to me. And you know, I had experience, again, behind the scenes, like what it's like to be on a national show. At that time, the show took calls, et cetera. So it didn't really, uh, it wasn't really unexpected. But I think there is a difference between, oh, and the other thing, the other reason why it wasn't really unexpected is because when you're hosting a show like Radio Boston in, an audi in a market like this one, um, the audience has very high expectations already. <laughs> right? And so, like, your journalism has to be up there. So it's not as if it was like that BUR's local journalism is down here and it's national journalism is, is up there. Quality wise, they're the same. So there wasn't a big leap that way. Um, but um, I think the thing that didn't surprise me most, but in fact disappointed me, had nothing to do with the show, but everything to do with um, social media. Because my social media interactions when I was reporting locally were very high quality. People, people around here, they'd be like, oh, I disagree with you because you got this part of this bill wrong, Magna, check it out. Or like the actual like, elected official, Senator Chang Diaz, whatever, would be like, Magna, like, this is wrong, do this. Blah, blah. But there was a meaningful interaction on social media about the actual policies we were talking about. The instant, the instant I, we started doing national stuff or I moved to On Point, the, social, the quality of the social media interaction went straight down into, in, into the gutter. And I'd, if anyone looks like I pulled way back because there was no point. People would just see like NPR or public radios on point and they would just make decisions about what the show was about, not even knowing what the tweet was about. And they would just like spew something. So it was not good. Or yell at us for things other programs do. Right, or yell at us for things that never even happened on On Point. <laughs> yes, that's always fun, too. Um, I want to stick with On Point. Margaret alluded to this, that we really revamped the show and to yeah. make good on the promise. Um, when we did that, we were among the only people in this building. Um, so we were you know, working through a pandemic. It was just three of us from On Point yep. here in the building. And we were relaunching a national show uh, that felt like a very high pressure situation in a pandemic. Uh, so I want to play a clip from what was supposed to be our first show in the relaunch. It goes through air, Bob. That's always tougher than the touch. You know, the touch, you don't have to touch things, right? But the air, you just breathe the air, and that's how it's uh, passed. And so that's a very tricky one. That's a very delicate one. Uh, it's also more deadly than your, you know, your even your strenuous flus. This is deadly stuff, President Trump said to Bob Woodward on February 7th. Three weeks later, though, to the American public, Trump was still downplaying the coronavirus threat. And again, when you have 15 people 
And the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero. Uh, that's a pretty good job we've done. From NPR and WBUR, this is On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Why do presidents sometimes do this? Know that there's an urgent, even imminent threat to the American people, but still play it down or do little to thwart the danger? We've been here before, in 2001. How high a priority was fighting al-Qaeda in the Bush administration? I believe the Bush administration in the first eight months uh, considered terrorism uh, an important issue, but not an urgent issue. The attacks of September 11th and the COVID pandemic. Now, we are not equating the two in cause or scale. Today, what we are doing is asking, what happens inside the room, in the Oval Office, in the Situation Room, in conference rooms of the most powerful politicians in America? What happens in the earliest, most crucial days of a new threat? And what drives a president not to act as decisively or quickly as possible? Dory produced that show, by the way. Uh, but that's not why we played it. Well, no, Dory, Dory produced that show, and it won an Edward R. Murrow National Award for the nation's best radio documentary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what, what is so... Please explain the significance of wishing, winning a national award in the documentary category for what we're doing daily. Um, so, there's no category that in, in the journalism awards world that On Point actually fits in right now, because we're trying as much as we can every day to bring in deep, rich background reporting and production, like you heard there, uh, and th that piece, that story, that hour included another big, like, unique report, uniquely reported piece in it, um, along with talk and interview and conversation. So. Um, the only category that we're close enough in is radio documentary, even though we're like a daily program. We're trying to pump this stuff out every day. So um, it, that's when we hit it, that's why it sounds like a different kind of experience, I hope. And the funny thing is, Dory said that that was supposed to be our first show um, when the show relaunched. But we had to hold it by a week because the show had actually relaunched the week before. And President Donald Trump came down with COVID that week. So and we, taking that story full circle, I mean, Anna yeah. Benstead was working with us, the same person who brought you to WBUR. And we really wanted to do this show. We had worked on it. We were ready to relaunch on point. We were excited about the relaunch. And she really had to tell us, we, we cannot yeah. do this. like, oh my god, he might die. What are we going to do? We need to wait a week. Yeah. So, But it ultimately aired, and it turned out yeah. just fine for everybody. Yes, <laughs> it did. It, it, it's. Um, it's a singular hour. And Dory worked on it for months. And it was excellent. Yeah. Well done. Are um, they telling you that you can't do the other one? What? Can we do the other one? This is a classic Dory and Megna problem. Can you where wait we produce five, two guys, hours of content? Can we go five minutes for a one work? hour conversation? We can? <laughs> OK. OK. We're going to play one more clip from On Point. Um, oh, wait, sorry. Can I, since you give me an extra few minutes? <laughs> this never happens on the radio. I like, actually have to stop. Um, but. Uh, I just want to say, you heard in that beginning, again, another one of those keyhole questions. Because we were just like, how is it possible that this man had a clear understanding of the COVID threat and like didn't do anything? OK, well, we know because there's a lot of answers to that. But who was, who was around him specifically telling him things at that moment? And can they tell us why the entire administration, or most of it, did not act? And then you know, 9-11 being the other big example because of the warnings the Bush administration had. So it's just like one little question. Like we couldn't stop thinking, like, how did you do? Why, like, what's going on? And then Dory did some very deep dive reporting and um, you know, ended up talking to ex-CIA people who were like, look, we've seen it in multiple administrations. Every president brings in, thus far, his own prejudices. And the duty of the institution around that person is to overwhelm the prejudices with facts, OK? And it's hard sometimes. It was hard in August of 2001. Uh, and obviously, it was impossible. 
uh, in late 2021 or 2019 and 2020. But the, the takeaway from that, what Cover Black said, is like it happens with every administration. So if the institutions around the president are weak, we all suffer. And that was the takeaway from that hour. Yeah, and just one more thing, which is that this is what we're really striving to do at On Point, is to, when the media was saturated in coverage of the Woodward tapes of Donald Trump saying all those things, what is, what's not in the coverage? What are people not understanding in the context and the nuance and the questions that aren't being asked? And that was really one of our best examples of getting it right. But another really great time that we, we got it right um, was during the trial of, uh, Derek Chauvin. So let's take a listen to that that piece. I was watching the news in Montclair, California. Dramatic videotape obtained by Channel 5 News. Me and my sister were playing. Shows what appears to be a group of LAPD officers beating a suspect. And all of a sudden, I look on the screen and they mention the name. Prior to his release from jail last night, 25-year-old Rodney King uh, showed his injuries to his reporters. Thing. And I'm like, he has the same name as my dad. What a coincidence, you know? And then as I looked around and looked at my family's reaction, I put two and two together like, wait, what's going on? And then my mom yelled, that's Rodney. Uh, in our review, uh, we find that uh, the officers uh, struck him with batons of between 53 and 56 times. And um, my heart shattered because right before she said that, I thought to myself, whoever this human is, there's no way they can live through that. The bruises, broken legs, and the scars from the stun gun it's which jolted a, him with 50,000 volt shots. I can say after the um, first three good good licks with one, you know, one with that, with the uh, shocker and the next with um, the billy club across the face. I was scared, I was scared. I was scared for my life. And I just think about often like, and we all been in t-shirts and we, we've worked out, so we know how this is when you work out and your shirt's like sweaty. Now imagine that, but being that your own blood and you're constantly being tased and you're getting yelled at to be still. King claims and several witnesses support him that he never resisted. I've never been tased, um, but I've, I got whoopings as a kid. And it's like, my mom would be like, be still. Well, um, you're whooping me. How am I going to be still? Because my nerves are going to have a reaction. I kneeled to my knees, and spread my hands out, and hit the ground as slow as I could. Because I didn't want to make any, you know, stupid moves. Because I'm already wondering, like, I mean, why are these guys, why are they drawing down on me? And I can't run from that videotape. That's something that I can't escape from because that comes out in regular conversation. I could be anywhere. And so that's the part that bothers me to actually watch a human being crawl for his life, let alone it just so happened to be my father. So that obviously was Rodney King's daughter. And Dory had come up with this. She was like, she wanted to know she has this question about like how similar is what we, we were seeing in the Chauvin trial to what had happened in the trial of the four LAPD officers in the early 90s. And, um, and the video component. And the, yeah, and the, the video component, right? Because the beating of Rodney King was the first like video evidence that went around the world of police brutality um, uh, in the United States. And so the, so Anna Bauman, the producer of that hour, she, convinced Laura King to talk. And that's the first part of this like beautifully constructed piece. And she talks later about more about what she was what she was thinking as she was watching the Chauvin trial. And it's fascinating because she kept talking about thinking about whether um, uh, George Floyd had children, right? Because she was a child seven years old when her father was brutally beaten by police officers and how they're gonna carry that for the rest of their lives. And then in the, sec in, the la in the second part of the hour, we spoke with um, the man who was Rodney King's civil attorney, because mm -hmm. you'll recall the criminal case, the LAPD were found um, innocent, but then later found criminally liable because of the, uh, sorry, civilly liable because of the civil case. And his attorney, we talked to him live, and he was outstanding because he very forensically was like, well, this argument was made, like, Defense attorneys said this about Rodney King, even though he wasn't the one on trial in 1992, 93, and they're saying literally the exact same thing about George Floyd, right? And so the parallels were 
profound and unavoidable. And so there were some key differences, like who was in the jury in the Chauvin trial? It was a much more diverse jury than the Simi Valley trial uh, in California. But um, it was a, this demonstration about how in the criminal justice system, very little has changed um, in terms of how cases are tried um, when police officers are on trial. And I'll just say two things about that, and then we're going to wrap up with a lighter question, <laughs> possibly. By um, the way, that one also won well, a national yeah. award. It just won a national Gracie yeah. Award. I, I mean, I'm not one to, I really, I, for the sake of my team who does incredible work, I am going to brag on their behalf. It's quite something for a show to be relaunched, to essentially be a new program, and win two national awards in its first two years. So good job, guys. It worked. But what I want to say about Meghna in that is that the only reason that those shows happen is because you are an incredibly engaged host. You don't just show up in the studio. I believe on that piece, you were probably working into the wee hours of the morning to get that done and edited and help support the producers who need to get that extra 10 yards to get it to the finish line. And so I want people to know that you are not just preparing for the live interviews. You are very much in the trenches with us every day to make the show happen. On this note, this is actually, um, I'm, I'm curious for this answer who I need to go try to go book, um, but who is your bucket list interview at On Point? Oh man, people ask me this and oh, I don't know, oh, who's my bucket list interview? I don't really know. I. I'm so sorry to whoever asked that question. I don't know, and here's why. It's because like, the show isn't built around individual people anymore. We're trying to like deepen understanding about our complex world. So I think about every day, like, what are the questions, or like, what are the things that we want to figure out, and how do we find the right people to help us do that? So I don't know. I'm really <laughs> sorry. I'm really, I don't have a good answer to that. It's such a letdown. Ask me another one, because it's a letdown when the person's like, I don't know. What is the most fulfilling part about hosting On Point the way it is today? The most fulfilling part, without a doubt, is when somebody reaches out and says, I didn't know that I wanted to know about that, but I couldn't stop listening. And now I understand things a little bit better. So I mean, if, if two million people hear that and only one person writes the email, I'm still fulfilled. <laughs> so, but, but, but that's, you know, like that's, that's a, it, it's, it's fulfilling because that's what we're trying to do, right? Like we're all trying to understand this completely crazy world of ours right now. And to like, there's a book that's a title called Brighten the Corner Where You Are. So if we can brighten the corner where we are on any particular day, then um, I'm glad that we have a chance to do that. And 10 minutes over, we'll Sorry. wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Dory, um, you brighten the corner where we are. Um, you know, you surpass expectations every day, and I think you surpassed all our expectations tonight. You know, I've, I've known, I've had the privilege of knowing you, I think, at least for a decade and a half. Yep. Um, I learned more about you tonight than I've known in that decade <laughs> and a half. I have the privilege of spending a lot of time with Megna. That was magnificent. Let's just give another round to Dory and Megna. Um, for the magnificent work they do every day. Um, I love, you, you, you had to notice that this is, the Magna is a producer, a former director, and a host. Did you notice that she kept looking at the clock? She was trying to do a back time, and for the first time in her life, she could actually break the back time. So um, I also want to thank our, our small but mighty membership team who made tonight happen. So let's give them a round of applause. And. Most importantly, um, I want to thank all of you. You know, we couldn't do this without you. And um, we know how precious your time is. So we're so moved that you came out on this soggy, rainy night to spend an hour and 11 minutes with us. <laughs> um, and that you spend so much of your precious time with us every day. Let's give a, a round of applause to all of you. Thank you so much. That's it. Drive safely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. <laughs>